My name is Eric, and I'm here with my sidekick and partner tonight, Michael Thundercrap and Kester. Yeah, that's me. How uh, are you doing, man? I'm, you know, I'm doing fantastic. Are you ready for another Rocky and Asia thing? You, uh, Journey Part 2? Journey Part 2. So, um, we did one of these episodes a while back. Yeah. If you happen to not, if, oh man, I really hope this is nobody's first episode of Double Feature, <laughs> always my fear. Uh, we're doing a strange, convoluted, totally wrong, but we're so making it up as we go. Right uh, thing. We have a lot of movies that we want to cover, and we needed to come up with a scheme. Yeah, and we're calling it a journey. This is our scheme. So we're going to cover all the Rocky movies, uh-huh. and we're going to cover the evolution of Japanese samurai movies as it came to America and then returned, boomeranged, boomerang back, back to the homeland. So you're still going to go really broad with that. You're not You're not going to say, like, the evolution of Michael Kester's DVD library. Of no. I think, I think once films. we get to the end, you'll totally understand this journey. I'm so, actually kind of proud of it. So there's basically about six notable Asian films in, in the, entire the existence world. of man. Actually, seven, because uh, there's another one that we're going to do. Ichi the Killer. Yeah. That, you know, that needs to happen soon, too. I'm tired of waiting on that shit. We were going to do it, and then it seems like, well, we got to do another Rocky episode. That definitely yeah. has to come up. And then so much Japanese all at once. People might need to read subtitles twice this month. That might just need to happen. Not a big deal. I am going to give our listeners the credit. I'm going to say they, unlike Rocky Balboa, can read. We're going to spoil both Rocky II and Sex and Fury. Perfect. Beautiful. And I think we're going to go in that order because that yeah. seems to be the established order. If you uh, don't want to know uh, how Rocky II ends, if you don't know how Rocky I ends, we might spoil ooh, Rocky Yeah, one. definitely going to spoil that. Um, and if you didn't see the previous episode with Rocky and Shogun Assassin, we'll probably talk a little Shogun. Probably won't spoil it. If you don't want to get spoiled, we got chapters up in the thingy with the drop and the click. And the, then you're all the way on to next week even. So we begin with Rocky II. And uh, the music is what we begin with. We begin with the and music. It. And the large scrolling, sure. we're aware this has become an American icon. Yeah, right. We're no longer dealing with uh, small independent Surprise films. classic. Yeah, right. We're picking up uh, really several minutes. Sure. Um, I was going to say several minutes after Rocky 1 ended. But, but it's actually... It's several minutes before yes. Rocky 1 ends. And um, I like this for two reasons. Okay. I like it for, well, for the first reason, if you look closely, you get to see the uh, Steadicam operator in the bottom of the wide shots. Okay. And we spent a lot of time talking, excuse me, I spent a lot of time boring you with Steadicam stuff. Oh, it doesn't bore me. There are uh, certain things that don't bore me. The other things are the ones People wearing harnesses to film movies. Big on harnesses. Love harnesses. All right, great. Um, so that was thing number one, but thing number two is this movie calls bullshit on itself. Yeah. The entire purpose of showing that little, I mean, not the entire purpose perhaps, but the only bit of important dialogue from, uh, the opening ain't going to be no rematch. Ain't going to be no rematch, which is, uh, essentially what happens in Rocky mm-hmm. two is ain't going to be no, ain't going to be no rematch. Exactly. And like all directly after, uh, sequels, Has we to start in the hospital, go to the hospital. That's just the spot you want to be, right? The point you know you made a good first film in your franchise is when your leads have to be hospitalized. Sure. That's when <laughs> right. you know that the trip that they took, the arc of the film, ended with them expended and sure. completely just... So they were done. They had to yeah. go to the hospital, yeah, right? exactly. They, they are just alive enough to be in the second film. And have an argument in wheelchairs. That's, yeah, that's just about it. Don't you let your orderly wheel you out on me. Right, don't you run out on me as Rocky gets wheeled out. <laughs> uh, don't you run out on me. So uh, the the movie kind of takes place over about a year. What, mm-hmm. what is it, 10, 10 months, months? As the, the guy says at the end of the movie uh, when they're calling that stuff out. The first movie was made in 76, and mm-hmm. we're all the way up to 79 yeah. now. So you can do whatever kind of weird math to place this in 76 or 77, or say the old movie was in the future, or whatever you want to do there. More importantly, production-wise, is that we are now in the territory of directed by Sylvester Stallone. Right. Sylvester Stallone... See, I'm new to Rocky. Mm-hmm. I'm the Rocky newbie here. Right. So I understand that Stallone both wrote the first Rocky and Mm -hmm. was the first Rocky. True. And now you're telling me that he wrote Rocky two 
is Rocky Two Two and directed Rocky Two as well. Also produced uh, wow. Rocky Two. Um, That's a full plate with another gentleman, but I just like to attribute him to as many things as possible here. Uh, did the cinematography sure. as well. One man, one vision. Yeah, I imagine that if you're going to operate a Steadicam, you have to look like Sylvester Stallone yeah. does. I just assume that that's how fucking heavy those things are. So we get a couple things coming back, one of which is uh, what you have deemed the Soggy Alley Boys. Soggy Alley Boys. Right. So as our story's progressing, they're getting married kind of quick, just uh-huh. jumping into the sure. whole Well, it's it's part of the later thing. it's part of the later plot, but it it's just a, you know, it's another point that they I kind they kind of need to do it. At this point they've been together they need to get married just because it was the seventies, and I guess that's the accepted way American to show that a couple. Success story, man. Yeah, that's the thing. The sure. next step, married, you get married, baby. You have a kid, and you come back from title retirement. Match. I guess. Yeah, it's the American dream, really. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny actually to think about that as the American dream, uh, the the life, liberty, and pursuit of property. Uh, <laughs> Rocky basically has everything at sure. the end of the first movie. Yeah, it seems like thirty-seven he's, grand. He's completely, yeah, 37 grand, all you need. He, that doesn't even run our show for six months. <laughs> uh, he's got everything he needs. He even finds, uh, you know, an apartment. Sure. Um, they find this place which is barren mm. and empty, and that's probably what it looks like when you're just barely scraping enough together to buy a place like that. I don't know if they're buying it or if they're renting it. because he said he's got to pay the rent. starts to seem really fucking poor after, yeah. uh, before too long. I'm you know? leaning towards renting. Maybe renting to own. We call it leasing to own. And by we, I mean everybody who isn't me because Doesn't have seven I, roommates. I rent. So I'm going to be kind of honest with you here. Okay, be completely honest. Normally I would try and fix this in post or drag you back in the studio or uh-huh. something. But after we covered the last Rocky movie, I was a little sad. Uh-huh. I was a little troubled by something. Yeah. I felt that I had kind We're of... unfair to Polly. I No, not at all. Fuck him. Everybody still to I, I'm waiting for the Pauly uh, intervention. Yeah, where everybody sits down and goes, I know it's been 12 you got, years. You got a but, snow cone problem, but you have a, now he's eating snow cones. It's like he was never abusive, right? <laughs> except when he's in a scene with a bunch of birds and smacks the baby right out of you. Fucking Pauly. Uh, I'm not going to get down on Pauly though. The thing that I was seriously a little troubled about uh-huh. is I felt I had completely failed to appropriately articulate the amount of heart that's Uh, in these movies you're getting a little bit too much inside rocky balboa's head can't really get the words out don't know what you're talking about that's you know what you mean but you can't make yourself say it i'm identifying so much with the character that i can't even speak could you imagine (laughs) if rocky did this podcast yeah that would be glorious so i mean here's the thing you know i watch these movies and i have a soft spot for these movies and i don't know if it's identifying with the troubles of these characters Mm -hmm. or just kind of you know, making the journey through the mundane but necessary and rewarding parts. The sure. things like buying a place. Yeah. Right? The thing, yeah, where it's it's a doubly extended metaphor. From what I've seen, what it mm-hmm. seems like is we have, I've seen only two films. But and the first both, two go very well together yeah. before we venture into other territory. In both of these films, we have this guy who's kind of down on his luck. Terrible things are happening to him. We talked about him being the, the yeah. Uh, underdog. Yeah, last he's time. the absolute underdog. Then he gets in the ring and gets literally, instead of life beating the shit out of him, right. he gets somebody beating the shit out of him. Yeah, somebody's literally beating him down. And he triumphs, and his triumph is not only a literal triumph, but it ends up bolstering his life as a whole. Sure. Well, his triumph also becomes you tied. Yeah. <laughs> How great is it that you tied? Isn't yeah. that great? And so that's about as good. You know, there's almost something uh, comical yeah. about well, the underdog yeah. wins. And by wins, we mean he yeah. ties. Isn't it that comes great? down to it comes down to you didn't lose. Right. Yeah. For, yeah. for once, you're not a loser. And, you know, I wanted to cover these movies, uh, especially as extensively as we're covering them, not just for our love of franchises and our love of uh, newfound love, I guess, of bringing all the listeners on a journey here. But also because this is a very unusual genre for us, mm-hmm. uh, this sort of almost uh, soap opera ish yeah. drama, right? Very, yeah, it's not something we often cover. We've uh, kind of gotten into it a little bit with human studies territory, yeah, right? But even that, you know, there are extreme ends of the spectrum, or it's something uh, very twisted about it. And this is a very real world type of drama. Mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of times these movies fall short. They're the type of things you invest in for a very brief period of time. And then you mentally check out when the movie is done and you never come back to it. 
And Rocky's one of those franchises, the even just the movies individually, that lingered with me yeah. for a long time. It stayed with me, and I felt like with a lot of my favorite movies on the show, they're movies that the beauty is in the simplicity. Yeah. It doesn't set out to do these crazy, crazy things. You know, next week, uh, little heads up, we're going to talk about The Matrix. Uh-huh. That's going to be a prime example of movie that does crazy shit. Right, and we're going to talk a lot about the the expansive things sure. that it maybe it sets out to accomplish or accomplishes on accident mm-hmm. or whatever. Rocky wants to tell a human story. It wants to tell it with human beings. It wants to hit the same type of you know you get these little montages for training. You yeah. get uh, beats and character arcs where there's obvious progress between two people. There's emotional tension. Yeah, it's the sort of things Growth. where. Yeah, they're they're almost cliches for yeah. well, dramas. They, they, you, they really are. You expect them to be there, and Rocky does them wonderfully. Uh-huh. They, you know, they completely work. The thing for me is the ending of of this film. Right, mm. the film seems to be setting up that Rocky's not good enough, and the typical underdog story would have him go into the ring and win. I'm sitting here going, seen a lot of films. I'm kind of jaded. The best ones are the ones where the one you want to win, actually reality hits them and they can't win. They can't win, right. And he ends up winning, and instead of feeling, oh, yeah, that's a little cliche, I'm thinking, that's great. I'm really happy yeah, that he Yeah, you're won. very excited yeah. about it. Yeah, You're love very it. glad he Fucking won. Fucking love it. You know, he's overcome a lot of this, uh, this other drama throughout the movie. It's about time that the guy gets to fucking win something. So, you know, you have these very normal people with very normal problems, a story about... Just simply two people trying to make it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes rather than being in space or fighting Jason in hell, you need to watch two other people struggle through yep. normal lives sure. and achieve something out of that. Mm-hmm. And then, so we focused on the characters a lot last time. And so I guess I'll forgive myself a little bit for that because we wanted to set a lot of stuff up. But as we see these characters progress, you know, these are still very normal. Uh, they're very normal looking people. Yeah. These are very average people. They're not incredibly intelligent or maybe even incredibly good at what they do sure they're incredibly there for each other and that's just about it they have their uh their quirks and they have their their definite vulnerabilities but i mean uh, you know we'll perform a tiny bit of an exercise here okay if you're going to use give me a couple words to describe who is rocky balboa what just comes to your mind adjective wise uh, fighter with heart, sure. probably. Uh, that's that's one. Um, nice guy first, right. winner second. And then we're looking at some of the things he's attempting to do here. And uh, I might not be as harsh as to say failure is an adjective to describe him, but he's got some obvious shortcomings, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, so we're looking at a guy who maybe can't read right. and uh, maybe not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Certainly I think not a good actor. <laughs> not a, yeah, not a very good in his commercials. So, you know, when you when you think about this guy, you think about a lot of the terms that the the film has made you feel. Mm-hmm. You think about, wow, what a winner. But you also can't avoid thinking about Rocky as somebody who's not too smart, somebody who's not too bright. You almost can describe him by his vulnerabilities. You know what I mean? Yep. And I think those shortcomings help make him that human character. It's uh, the fact that you might describe him and even... You know, when we talked about Adrian last time, I think the first thing I threw out was that she's shy, mm-hmm. right? Another thing where we're kind of describing someone by their shortcomings, by their flaws. So instead of giving a hamster style type of, oh no, what about Rocky and his bad ticker? You know, instead we have flaws that define the character. Right. They're not just things to pop up later. You know, his eye gets fucked up in yeah. the last movie. That becomes a really integral part of the plot sure. of his strategy in this well, movie. Well, it becomes an integral part of boxing. That's a, you know, another great piece of the writing to credit Stallone, not just for knowing who that character is and being able to write the dialogue and still fitting in more stupid jokes, yeah. which are an amazing part of this character, but also to come up with this strategy of he has a bad eye. And so to throw Apollo off, you know, we talked about one of the great things about the last movie is the fact that they tied in that was realistic because to expect him to be this out of nowhere supreme boxing champion just because of a montage mm-hmm. is a tiny bit more than people might be able right. to deal with. So here he has to beat Apollo. How are we going to do that? Well, we give him a tiny bit of a trick, right? That he's switching styles. Sure. And by switching styles, he also compensates for his bad eye on sure. the other side. 
which is just a, I mean, it's a really, really uh, clever kind of gimmick and something that feeds into his character and who he has to be and how he has to train. It's, uh, it really is part of that character rather than a, you know, thing to pull up in the ending hamster style plot device. So that all comes up in the fight. But before we even get to the fight, it's, uh, you know, we see Rocky trying to get out of fighting. He's right. trying to be done with that. Sure. I think partially because Adrian doesn't want to see. We could see how visibly upset she is. Sure. By well, he's it. got a kid. He's got to be responsible. He's got to work at a meat shop or. Right. <laughs> Try to work at a meat shop. And, you know, this is another one of those things. If you want to bring him down from champion, you put him in this position that is really humiliating. Yeah. He's attempting to sell out and can't even. Do- what if you tried to sell out and couldn't sell out? How fucking awful is that? If the offer was on the table to sell yeah. out, but you were incapable of selling out? I'm going to uh, sacrifice part of my integrity, and I'm going to do these stupid ads to make ends meet and whatever. And you show up that day, and it turns out the uh, the real clincher, the real thing you thought was going to be the root of this decision, uh, you can't read cue cards, so you're kind of fucked on there. Yeah, it's beyond your control, and it doesn't work out for You've you. You've just embarrassed yourself. You know, and that automatically kind of resets him. That automatically brings him back down to a level where he can be people's champion again one Mm -hmm. day. So here he is trying to find this uh, so-called honest job, and he can't. He's not smart enough to do that either. He just doesn't have, you know, what it takes to do desk work, first of all, uh, to sit down at work. Or even to, you know, he doesn't even have the seniority to work at this, uh, this meatpacking plant. A job that even Polly can get. Yep. Polly and his fucking snow cones. So he's resisting his calling and inevitably he has to go back to it. Mm-hmm. Because he's a guy that, you know, another kind of admirable part of him is that he has drive. He wants to be a better person. He's never content with having this crappy life. Right. Maybe he was all the way up to the point where he met Adrian, but now he's got a family and he wants better things for them. And his demeanor throughout that is incredible. And really, when I talk about Rocky having heart and all of these characters having heart, I think the demeanor is a lot of that. Mm-hmm. I'm one of those very humanistic films. We were talking about uh, Happy Go Lucky, the Mike sure. Lee film, and the character in that, Poppy, who was almost an experiment as a character. Right. Maybe superhuman. You know, nothing upset her. That's what that movie is about. It's about a character who is always optimistic really when faced with any fucking situation possible. And so when we talked about that, I mentioned, wow, that'd be a really great way to live your life. Wouldn't your life be so much better if we could do that? And uh, in the weeks that have followed that, I think we've both found that it's very, very hard to do. That is certainly true. But Rocky is what I think it would look like if a real life person tried this. You know, as we see this guy down on his luck, he is laughing off the insults that happen in the beginning of the movie. Right. He doesn't take things too seriously. You know, it's just life, not a big deal, enjoy it, move on. He's joking about these completely grave, you know, sort of situations. Mickey keeps saying, Apollo Creed will fucking kill you. Sure. He's, He's going to break most, your face into a million most pieces. dangerous man in the world, in the sport. And you have a shitty eye and your, your balance is thrown off and you're not good enough. And Rocky, you know, he just keeps throwing out these things like, oh, yeah, the doctor said I should stop and I say I should keep going. So there's that problem solved. Don't worry about it. And it just I kept remembering back to Poppy so much. Also, like that film, you have these supporting characters that let him show off how grounded he is Mm -hmm. so he can bounce off of that. I think the best my favorite example easily out of this movie is press press uh, conference press conference right (laughs) yeah so what's going on in this press conference there's this press conference where there it's right after rocky has decided to go back into the ring with apollo Mm -hmm. and they're interviewing the two fighters and they ask apollo a question you know where's the fight gonna be and apollo says it's gonna be in philadelphia because i want this man's hometown to watch me destroy him yeah watch him be humiliated turn him into a pile of human remains and then they say to rocky what do you think about this being in your hometown, Rocky Balboa? He's like, oh, yeah, that's, that's like 10 minutes from my house. That's really nice for me. <laughs> I know. It's great. He, Apollo is so intense. Sure. He is so fucking showbiz. And, you know, in the first Rocky, we're talking about him being a good guy, but being very showbiz, being a very businessman about it, very mm-hmm. professional. And he goes out and he talks a good game. And a lot of times he can back that up. 
And uh, Rocky, not even phased by it. Ten yep. minutes from my house. That's going to be awesome. I'm going to buy Polly a snow cone machine. I'm <laughs> sorry. I keep mentioning these fucking snow cones. I well, just they're think, ridiculous, well, right? It's so weird. This guy was a raging alcoholic, and he kicked it using snow, snow cones. Snow cones, right. There might be a hidden gem in here that we really should explore in solving alcoholism using snow cones. If only we could go back to Mary and Max and just replace the sherry. I think of these characters, Mick is the only one who isn't... Uh, necessarily a very real world character Mm -hmm. not to say that mickeys don't exist because they certainly do but he's the only really cartoon we have sure well he's he's the he's the cinematic character yeah well he needs to be yeah absolutely you know i'm thinking about this as we have the intensity in the church which is kind of a a funny scene and uh you know he's talking to rocky he's basically the kind of person who can himself inspire a character that is meant to be the inspirational character Sure. When the inspirational character is down in his luck, you bring in Mickey to basically kick his ass. And he does. And we get to this match that I think is much more brutal than oh my God. the match the first time around. It is so much worse. He's getting socked in the face maybe 20 or 30 times before he even throws a punch. Uh, everyone is painful. Then There's they a slow crunching it down. sound. So you were visibly excited I by, was. This, uh, by this fight. Now, as we watch these movies... The artsy stuff, the drama, sure, uh, that all really appeals to me. It's not lost on me. Oh, certainly not to say it's lost on okay. you, but you are a chicken-chasing guy. Oh, my God. You love to chase the chickens and beat people in the skull. Sure. And I have rarely on this show seen you as excited <laughs> as when we were watching. The, if, if For me, I mean, I'm not into sports, yeah. but occasionally I'll come across, say, a room of people watching football, and they'll start shouting and throwing things yeah. and jumping up calling, and down. Calling the players' names. That was about what was going on it with really you was. while you were watching this fictional, my yeah. Dad, yeah. uh boxing match. What's going through your head here? Michael? I don't know. It's just, I keep seeing him get hit in the face. It's hard. It's hard. You just, at this point, I mean, honestly, had, no, there was really, I wanted Rocky to win so yeah. bad. You, I wanted, you so do, yeah. I wanted him to, honestly, I wanted him to come out of the ring and swing his left arm one time <laughs> right. lay apollo out end of movie fucking destroy him right? yeah and so when he comes out and starts taking a beating i'm just heartbroken and See, every that's time he I'm gets hit about. it's like they're punching me in my emotion organ right whatever one that is i think that's your brain when a lot uh, of people will say heart but that's your brain when the two of us who often strive to see our protagonist built up and then lose horribly sure. because it you know it makes us happy to see cinema do that this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying this movie is effective. Mm-hmm. It is a simple, simple, minimalistic drama, and it does it so well that when we get to an ending boxing match, sure. boxing, by the way, which neither of us really give a shit right. about, although if there were a sport that I may be interested in, uh-huh. it could be two human beings that have elected to beat the tar out of each other. Totally optional thing. They volunteered to do it out of choice. Uh, something absurd and amazing about that. We don't care. We're not invested in the sports. We're only invested because of the characters. Yeah. And suddenly we need to see him. It's very emotional. Yeah. It's weird. At this point, every time he gets hit, you feel it tenfold because every time he takes a punch, you know that everything has happened to him. Yeah. You know his backstory. Sure. So him getting punched gets piled on top of that. It does. Every yeah. time. It's as if the guy sitting in the temp agency job placement office is punching him in the face. Yeah. You know, and the punches, I mean, the spit is flying. It's these these kind of moments we've uh, we talked about in Machete or we talk about with Planet Terror. I, I think in Sin City we talked about audience reactions, mm-hmm. you know, the sort of thing you do in your movie. And it's uh, it's really one of my favorite kind of moments in film where you execute a scene and it forces a human reaction sure. out of an audience as if you smacked them in the face they make this audible, oh, there's yep. just this sound, yep. and it's so universal. Everybody does it. Mm-hmm. We're both, we both see the same punch, and we both go, oh, fuck, that has to hurt. You know, it's just, it's amazing how universal and how effective it is, and uh, the, just the sort of mastery behind yeah. creating a moment like that. What I love beyond this, though, is as if you were a fan of a sport, mm-hmm. uh, where the, that sport is not boxing, but boxing in cinema, uh-huh. I'm seeing that you're excited not just about the match, but about the plot implications of yeah. the match, whether you're aware of it or not. And uh, for the purposes of our audience, 
you are not only shouting things like hit him, just fucking hit him, <laughs> but also they better not hit each other and fall over on the mat at the same time. <laughs> I would be pissed. That would be cheap. <laughs> you're worried that the movie might cop out. Yeah. So you're simultaneously going, man, I hope Rocky wins. And also, man, I, I hope, hope Rocky good, two wins. Good screenwriting. <laughs> yeah, I hope Rocky two wins at the same time. And they're, you know, they're upping the fight choreography. There's these close ups and slow motion. You're just feeling the, the teeth smacking against the fist. <laughs> Uh, it really is a, a pretty amazing fight at the end of it. I think the the thing that probably impresses me the most, you know, that we're really talking this movie up and we're mentioning all these great things. At the end of the day, these are movies about working out. Yeah. These are movies about a guy bulking up so he can fight people. Or at slimming least, down through snow cones. Sure. At least, uh, at, you know, on the surface. That's what these are movies about. And I think it's it's really impressive that this muscular guy... This impressively muscular guy wrote, directed, and also starred in said films. Absolutely fantastic. Sex and Fury is the next movie. Speaking of absolutely fantastic, Sex and Fury, probably one of my favorite 70s Japanese films. I've seen a lot of these. This is my new favorite thing ever. Okay. This, we're going to get to this pink stuff. Yeah. And I can't, e I can't even wait till the part where we're supposed to talk we're, about we're it. We're going to talk about it right now. I'm too... You don't can, have to wait. Can I say two things really quick? Is it Sex and Fury? <laughs> uh, there was another movie we debated doing. Oh, that's for true. For the record. Sure. For the journey record, uh -huh. if you would like an optional B movie for yeah. Sex and Fury. Yeah. Because this is not the right kind of double... This is a bad double feature. Sure. Uh, what's the other movie that we talked we about We were going to... I was considering bringing in Lady Snowblood, okay. which is really similar to mm -hmm. Sex and Fury, has all the same kind of revenge story, you killed my father sure. storyline that goes along with a lot of these female samurai movies, but it's a lot darker a lot more cinematic. It's a lot closer to Shogun Assassin. Yeah. And there's a lot less nudity. And you opted for nudity instead. I opted for pink film. Thank you for that. So we open here, uh, walking down this hallway. Yeah. Just um, uh, not the boy from the previous right, film. Right, but, but it's good if you think of him like the boy from the previous film. Yeah, if, just imagine it's a sequel. For the sake of the journey... Follow the same character. Yeah, it was a tiny girl in the previous film. Because if you imagine it's the boy from the previous film, this is going to get so weird. Yeah. And Japan will have to censor even more of it than I'm angry at them for anyways. <laughs> not yet, not yet, not yet. Um, so she's walking down, and there's some bad luck. Bad luck. And are you killing me because I'm a detective? Some cards fall, and uh, it's, it's really a gorgeous, yeah. gorgeous opening. And then flash forward to lots of nudity later. Yeah. Okay. So we didn't mention the cards. Okay. Should we just do that right now? That's easy enough. Sure. There's three cards that are sort of arranged. Well, I the card. Her father drops his his deck of Japanese right. cards. Right. And picks up three cards that feature three different emblems. Mm -hmm. And seemingly at random, but well, not seemingly at random. Very deliberately, he picks sure. up these cards, but they make no sense to you whatsoever. As only a detective would. Right. And then later on, we realize that they correspond with tattoos to his three killers. So it's a revenge film. Absolutely. All right, there's our plot. Okay, but before we get to discussing Sex and Fury, we have to discuss what Sex and Fury is besides fucking awesome. And that is a pink film. Okay. So what I need to say first about pink films is that they don't all have swords. All right. They're not all about fighting. They're sure. not all bloody. The one thing that pink films are is a lot of sex a lot of nudity, and a lot of female leads. So would you compare them to American sexploitation? Kind of, except there's a lot more nudity. It's The thing about American sexploitation takes something... We did the <laughs> Big Birdcage. distinct cage. lack of nudity, sure. perhaps. Yeah. yeah, we did the Big Birdcage last year, and there's, you know, three naked chicks that happen to run through a scene covered in soap, I don't know, you know, something yeah, right, like right. that. A little coy, a little weird. Yeah. It's kind of toying with sex but we've talked a lot in those movies when we covered those movies about are these even sexy sure. or are they just kind of right. weird exactly but in pink films it's sex it's nudity it's hot mm -hmm. it's perfectly 100 percent aware that it's gratuitous yeah it's exploitation to the nth degree but the kind of exploitation that actually exploits its subject matter and sure. not its audience not exploits the idea of right. the subject matter exactly and so a lot of this, well, you know, got misconstrued as being pornographic, mm -hmm. which it's not. Pink films are not pornographic. They have a plot. There's a reason. There's an art. Sure. It's, I mean, Sex and Fury is a, a great example of that because there are some 
beautifully put together scenes, certainly shots. I mean, there's some tension, some real storyline you feel for Ocho and the characters. You feel for just about everybody except for Red Mustache. Christina's handlebar mustache manhandler man, I yeah. think is he's the guy, you know, your job is done as a spy. He's the that, English, yeah. That guy. Your job is done with a spy and also your affair too. Yeah, I can't tell. I mean, I can't tell. He's a bad actor. Terrible actor. I'm I I guess it's He's as good as Rocky. Oh, you mean in the commercials? Yeah, I'm talking about the commercials. Right. I guess I'm just puzzled. I'm a little perplexed yeah. by maybe it's in Japanese. People don't sure. know how bad. Well, see, that's his the thing is, is it, it calls into question how bad are these Japanese actors? If because right. we don't know what they're saying or they how all their seem delivery really is. intense and incredible. Sure, we don't know what they're saying to us. We're reading subtitles, and even the subtitles, you, su- I will giggle. Right. Having seen this film three or four times, I will giggle, and then you will say to me, "Oh, it's probably lost in translation. Sure. She didn't actually say that." Right. But you know. To hit, he's speaking English in a Japanese film. There's Japanese subtitles right. under him, and he's just doing a terrible job of delivering these lines. Awful. But we don't need to derail ourselves on the handlebar. I want to talk about somebody who's doing an awesome job, if I Please, may. Please, I would love for you to. Uh, right about the time that I'm thinking our female lead, Ocho. Ocho. Right about the time I'm thinking this is the most attractive woman pretty much ever. Yep. Uh, she gets assaulted while she's taking a bath, and while completely naked takes out uh, 20 guys sure. with a sword with a sword she's tattooed she's fucking spraying blood everywhere it's getting all over her naked body and it's in slow motion too mm-hmm. she's doing flips completely naked in slow motion with a samurai sword taking down these other guys unapologetic zooms on her crotch and i'm I, saying uh, crotch not vagina right because you never actually see any pussy in this film unless you count the shadow from sure. behind there should be a name for, I'm sure in the porn industry, there is a name when there's a tiny bit of frontal genitalia displayed uh, from behind. Tiny Jiny, maybe? I'm not going to call it that. I'm uh, just floored by, uh, I'm watching this thing and it it reminds me of um, Eastern Promises and that's sure. all I'll say about that. I mean, my jaw is on the floor yeah. just like that. I can't. I can't believe this is that somebody captured this yeah. on film and it just keeps it's a, going and spraying blood and amazing. it's such a fantastic piece of art. Just that scene. It really is where you get nudity and samurais, right? This is the seventies. This is the heart of nudity and samurais as far as I'm concerned in cinema. So are these the same zooms that are the Dario Argento zooms? Very that we similar, see? except yeah. they're on private parts and there's just, they show, I mean, that's what I love about pink films is they're not, Oh, and now her tit slipped out. Yeah, right. It's There's her boob. Look, a nipple. <laughs> yeah. Look at how they bounce when she does sure. a fucking flip. I'm going to go put some perfume on for five minutes. Ooh, yeah. My right. boobs really feel good in my hands. <laughs> right. Right. It starts to remind me of some of the American sexploitation. Sure. But really, I mean, it never even gets to being that ridiculous. Almost Barbarella a little mm-hmm. bit. It's almost sex organ. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, it's it, it, it almost gets to the point where it, they're making a joke. Yeah, right. But again, with nudity instead sure. of with a fucking organ instead. You know, that's, a, that's another thing while we're on that subject, just sure. really quick, is that this character, you still have an enormous amount of respect for her given that she's... We're making her sound like a sexual object. Yeah, but she's not at all. And the film uh, just displays what a fucking badass she is. Sure. She has this incredibly intense look about her Mm -hmm. all the time. You know, those extreme zooms into her face that way. Well, it's this burning revenge. Right, right. Revenge really drives this genre. It was back with Shogun Assassin. Yeah. We'll see it. This is not the last time we'll see revenge. Revenge and honor, perhaps. And she is just furious. She has her objective... And really, her own dignity sure. stems not from her state of undress. Well, and the intense zooms you see in her eyes are they're really the same kind of ones you get yeah. of her ass. Sure. That when the film is saying, here we have a nipple shot, it's giving you the same kind of intense zoom mm-hmm. that you take completely seriously right. you know, to her eyes. A lot of times I've, I've talked in movies about it being crazy to me that, you know, there isn't more nudity and that that is such right. a taboo. And, sure. you know, this movie not only displays the nudity, it treats it as if it's, I mean, it's aware of what nudity is. Yeah. Uh, societally, it's aware that people are kind of going to this movie and seeing that. It calls the fucking movie Sex and Fury. Yeah, which is really the best title for this film. It's so, yeah, perfect title. But it's displaying it at least on par with those other cinematic Mm -hmm. elements. 
I want to talk about a poker showdown that okay. happens in this movie. So Christina is the other piece to this puzzle. There's mm-hmm. also a guy who Christina's in love with, kind of doesn't really play a role in the movie. The other thing about pink films is male roles tend not to be played up. Yeah. They're usually rapists or sex or, you know, love objects. Right. So we have this, uh, this, I, she's, I think she's supposed to be from England. From the UK, right? Yeah. Her accent sounds like she's from Eastern Europe. Yeah. But point is, she's hot and also gets naked. But Was the that thing, the point? I don't know if that was the well, point. Well, that's part of the point. But the other thing that I really like about not only her character, but the way her character is treated is her handlebar manhandler man says to her, you have to use your weapon. Right. And he could say this to Ocho as well. Right. You're wondering what her weapon is. You've seen that she's pretty decent with a handgun. But he explains that her weapon is her body. Yeah. And that is the heart of Christina's character. Yeah, it's really getting to that. And so we have this this character who's a spy, and she's got this back love story where she came to Japan solely to be reunited with this man she loves, but she's vicious and she's dangerous. And they pit her against Ocho, who we've already discussed is a vicious, dangerous, sexy sure. killer. And not in the way you would expect. They pit them against each other over a game of cards. Right. <laughs> That's essentially where we're writing these There's two characters. There's a lot characters. of cards in this, in this film. Uh, yeah, I didn't even think about it. I guess that goes with the overall theme, right? We have a poker showdown, which is something we've never talked about before. Mm-hmm. It's almost like a Mexican standoff, sure. but with poker. Yeah. It's one of these tension-filled scenes that uh, when we talked about the movie Rubber, what yeah. did we do? We did Rubber and... Tulane Blacktop. Yeah, we talked about... Um, one of the things that really excited me about Rubber was we can do this whole movie that feels like any other, uh, you know, film experience, sure. film adventure. With basic elements of a plot, if one at all. Yeah, and attire as yeah. your protagonist, you know, and still by constructing everything else appropriately and, you know, really showing up that day and doing your job. Turns out it's still a movie. Yeah, you can still accomplish the, the same kind of dramatic sure. tension and, and yeah. so forth. And it's the same thing with these poker scenes. Casino Royale is a, a great go-to oh, yeah. for that, uh, especially just because of the, the title of it. But a lot of that, you know, it revolves around mm-hmm. this. I will say that during this poker scene, I was also shouting at the screen. Yeah, right. This was just as much as maybe maybe it's the same thing for the boxing match, yeah. man. Maybe you just, uh, you know, you frame your shots correctly and you put your camera in the right place and you put the music where it should go and you have people care about the characters beforehand. Poker is one of these things where... I mean, I love poker. I have no idea how to play poker. <laughs> I'm so bad at poker that I couldn't physically play it. Wow. I would need someone to sit next to me and explain Kinda to me walk you through it. what to do. When do you hit? You don't yeah. hit in poker. That's blackjack, You don't right? hit. That's blackjack, yeah. yeah. What do you do with the raising and the cards and the yeah. calling? I don't understand it. And somehow just the part of the aesthetic of poker, part of the just the mood of that, Maybe it's uh, that scene in The Killing where they're planning and they have yeah. the, the dim yeah, sure. light. Smoky, it just, one yeah, light. It seems like that's what happens with poker tables. But if it's shot well, then you tell your story with music and with your camera. And uh, this scene uh, is a great example. I don't know anything about poker, but I know when someone has a good hand. Uh-huh. Why do I know that? I know that because of technical elements. Yep. Exactly. So I can go, oh my God, here's the tension's really getting amped up. What's she going to put down here? We don't know what the other person's hand is. You see you she, see one character and go, that's a lot of Ks. Yeah, right. <laughs> so that's probably really good, right? She really has something here. And um, the magic is that it fits into a shootout. Yeah. That, you know, or rather that the shootout fits into the poker game. Mm-hmm. They take a break. They go to a shootout. They come right back. And you don't feel like you've missed a beat here. Right. Um, it feels like the shootout is just part of, and I don't know about poker. Maybe that is part of the game. It is of poker. in the middle of every poker game. There's a required defense. You just have, yeah, you have your defense where attack, there's an sure. onslaught of waves of ninjas and sure. you have to shoot all their hands and then you can resume the game. Yeah. I, the, that, that is one of the best scenes in the film. I mean, I really, I, I'm proud of you. I don't mean to be <laughs> condescending. Okay. But I'm proud of you for picking out the better, the best scenes of the film. Cause the naked fight scene, sure. clearly one of the best. Honestly, kind of a big fan of the shootout in the train tracks yeah, right. where Christina dies. Right. Poker scene, wonderful. But also the uh, there's that nightclub scene with the <laughs> kind of the Sousa music, but yeah. they're whipping all the girls. It's a nightclub party where women are tied at the wrists uh, with rope that's hanging from the ceiling. And uh, I don't know, while being spanked with paddles. I'm not even really sure what to say about it yeah. other than just to sort of invoke it. 
let it, I don't know, dangle there awkwardly is what I was going to say. But yeah, but- a lot of a lot of these samurai films, a lot I mean, Shogun Assassin, Sex and Fury, absolutely. It's a lot of these really iconic the way they unsheath their swords sure, it's style. the way they move absolutely it's all stylistic there's a lot of those memorable moments though. yeah i mean even the the place the movie kind of ends where she's washing the blood off her breast by rubbing handfuls of snow on herself sure and then that great scene of the falling car i mean it's yeah you know when you said sex and fury perfect title i think sex and fury perfect ending um you wanted to talk a little bit about film versus yeah. pornography so i guess this is probably a good note to end on because this is something that I think is uh, honestly this was one of the bigger points of contention I had when choosing between Lady Snowblood and Sex and Fury. Mm. Not that I'm ashamed that I made a bunch of people watch naked chicks fighting with swords. No, not at all. But that I was afraid that because of the grand scheme of this journey, people would be turned off thinking, "Oh, double feature. Oh, there they are with their boobs again." <laughs> right. I I was a little nervous about doing it because I was afraid it would detract from the Japanese samurai cinema thing. Right. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I think it's really important to differentiate pink films, sex and fury, films with nudity from pornography. Mm -hmm. Especially, I mean, American cinema, a lot of people will say, I mean, people call what fucking hostile horror porn. Sure. We went off on that a long time ago. Yeah. And the thing about calling something horror porn is that nobody is actually having sex with anybody else in this movie. And I think, I mean, there's a lot of scenes where people are supposed to be having sex, right? Oh, so your distinction is more that pornography may be uh, closer to a documentary. than Sure. A, uh... It's reality. It's what's really good. I know there's acting in pornography and softcore porn, but the thing is... it. Honestly, if somebody watches Sex and Fury for our show, one of the members of Podmanity, male or female, no discrimination, and they go, that was hot, I'm going to watch it again and masturbate, <laughs> Right. then maybe it becomes porn. But does that, does the, the reaction to that dictate that then? No. Well, see, that's the thing. I, don't th- I think that porn is dictated by intention. Intention. If you make the film hoping people are going to masturbate, probably a porno. Well, this gets back to something we talked about when we uh, when we did the room on the show, sure, about whether or not intention dictates genre. I mean, I'm a I'm a bad person to ask about this because yeah. I view pornography as filmmaking. Sure, it's just something I have. I don't know. It's just a uh, it's a genre of yeah film. It's a type of filmmaking, and I feel like we could make a distinction, but perhaps it might be lost as arbitrary. Yeah, whether or not someone spanks to it, mm-hmm. or whether or not the intention is sure. something if it's for pleasure rather yeah. than for art. I don't see a reason pleasure and art should be. Yeah, separate. no, I fully agree. Well, which is which is one of the reasons I really love pink films is mm-hmm. because I feel like it's a celebration. I feel like it's exploitative in a wonderful way. Right. But I want to make the distinction that I'm not just putting Sex and Fury on the show because I think it's hot, though I do think it's hot. Japan finds it hot as well, but they also find it safe. Yes. There's something that makes me very, uh, very crazy about Japanese pornography. Mm -hmm. And um, (laughs) pixel boxes, I believe they're called. Maybe crazy would be a bad setup for that. Yeah, you know, the uh, I think this movie runs less of a risk of coming off as pornography because it doesn't look as hardcore by comparison of, you know, what American pornography sure. might look like. Um, what I'm essentially getting at is what we referred to earlier, that there is no full frontal nudity, uh, that there are no cocks in this movie, that there is no female genitalia found anywhere throughout the film, except maybe by shadow. And that's because pussy is illegal in Japan. Yep. I guess I should say genitalia in yeah. general. Is genitalia is illegal. Illegal in Japan. Since the early 1900s, really, they have this archaic law that says you can show breasts and you can show an ass, but you can't show frontal genitalia in, uh, in film, in print, or in pornography. And so what people basically do is they pixelate it. They, it kind of looks like uh, an anonymous suspect in yeah. Cops for our American listeners. Perfect. If you know what Cops is, that is what the leaders of Japan are forcing their citizens to do to the pornography that's they make what, over there. That's what the Japanese are being forced to masturbate to. That's to, is, to pixels, right. Yeah. 
to the uh, to the degree that they even sell these sort of. I think they're probably pseudoscience. These machines that will sort of depixelate, depixelate yeah, the pornography. Unscramblers. Yeah, it's a, a funny little box with different knobs on it. You kind of select the area that is scrambled and attempt to unscramble it. Which is funny because when I think about scrambled porn, I think about the American idea of you know growing up and not be trying to get porn on your cable set. Yeah. By moving sure. the rabbit ears around at two in the morning and mm-hmm. watching through the static. Yeah, absolutely. Something that I don't know if anybody from our generation ever did because TVs basically didn't work like that anymore. Right. But you know what I mean. Yeah. That idea. And so I'm being a little sarcastic when I'm saying genitalia is illegal, Mm -hmm. but not really. I mean, genitalia in print and in film literally is illegal. You cannot import it in the country. You cannot record it in the country. You can't post it on your Japanese hosted blog. If you uh, have a server, you run out of your home in Japan and you take American pornography with pictures of people's junk in it and you put it on your Japanese hosted website, uh, you can be arrested for that. Basically, genitalia in Japan is decriminalized. It's where <laughs> it's legal to own, right. not legal to sell or show other people. Uh, it's even frowned upon in educational use. I mean, it is that fucking ridiculous. Bullshit. And so uh, something that's kind of amazing that has shown up as a result of this, thank fuck for the internet, and I mean that more literally than I ever have before, uh, is I think it's called Urban. Uh-huh. I don't live in Japan, and I honestly know very little about Japan outside of their genitalia censorship laws, uh-huh. which is the, it really is just the little tiny sad note. Pink films, I mean, this whole thing I've discovered today sure. are going to be too good to be true. <laughs> so there is this one little thing that yeah. my favorite part of the female anatomy will never be on display in one yeah. unless it's bootleg, illegal, you mm-hmm. know, made illegally. So Urban is this sort of uncensored underground this super cool fucking punk rebellion that has sprung up in Japan where people are making pornography, black market pornography, with pictures of people's junk in it. Oh my God. You can see dick and balls in this pornography. You can see penetration in this pornography. You may even be able to see vagina in this pornography. Can you believe that? I, that's insane. And so it's an underground. It's a rebellion. Yeah. It's the resistance That's fantastic. That, is, uh, that is creating this. And you know what's great about that is it makes it even sexier. Oh, yeah. You know what's really sexy is twat. Even sexier, government banned twat. Fuck you, Japanese government. But thank you, Japan, for Sex and Fury. Absolutely. We're, uh, we're doing some more stuff on the show next time. We have a website, doublefeatureshow.com. We have an email address where we can correspond about how angry I am about the Japanese censoring the you know pornography. What? You, know, you know what we should do? Is, what should we do? Is let's ask Podmanity to join this fucking rebellion. <laughs> sure, and right. And send us pictures of your genitalia uncensored. Uh, that would be doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. You could uh, send those too. Uh, Japanese or not Japanese. You know what? If you live in South Philly and you want to send a picture of your junk, that's fine. That's even encouraged. I was Double going feature to say show it's encouraged. At gmail.com. I like talking about the rebellion. Let's talk about the rebellion more next time. I don't believe I've already spoiled inside the show maybe people chapter over they don't know but we're doing the matrix next time we are we're doing the matrix um we're gonna cover it like it hasn't been covered before um and then we're gonna cover rollerball which probably hasn't been covered before (laughs) right um some people have talked about rollerball somewhere and some people 12 years ago have talked about the matrix i should point out that we're covering the original rollerball with james conn from the 70s not the ll cool j vehicle all that needs to be said about that is i think rebecca romaine is cool and that's there really isn't 20 minutes to say about the new rollerball. Uh, I guess until next week, watch more fucking film. Goodbye. Got everything he needs. He even finds, uh, you know, an apartment. Sure. Um, they find this place which is barren mm-hmm. and empty, and that's probably what it looks like when you're just barely scraping enough together to buy a place like that. I don't know if they're buying it or if they're renting it because he's got to pay the rent starts to seem really fucking poor after yeah. uh, before too long. I'm you leaning know? towards renting, maybe renting to own. We call it leasing to own. And by we, I mean, everybody who isn't me because doesn't have seven I, roommates. I rent. So I'm going to be kind of honest with you here. Okay. Be completely honest. Normally I would try and fix this in post or drag you back in the studio or uh-huh. something. But after we covered the last Rocky movie, I was a little sad. Uh-huh. I was a little troubled by something. Yeah. I felt that I had kind We're of... We're unfair to Polly. I... No, not at all. Fuck him. 
Everybody still to I I'm waiting for the poly uh, intervention yeah. where everybody sits down and goes I know it's been 12 you got, years you got a but, snow cone problem but you have a, now he's eating snow cones it's like he was never abusive right <laughs> except when he's in a scene with a bunch of birds and smacks the baby right out of you fucking poly uh, I'm not going to get down on poly though the thing that I was seriously a little troubled about uh-huh. is I felt I had completely failed to appropriately articulate the amount of heart that's uh, in these movies. You're getting a little bit too much inside Rocky Balboa's head. Can't really get yeah, the words it, out. Don't know. know what you're talking about. That's you ex- know what you mean, but you can't make yourself say it. I'm identifying so much with the character yep. that I can't even speak. Could you imagine <laughs> if Rocky did this podcast? Well, boys, looks like we started the fun without me. My name is Eric, and I'm here with my sidekick and partner tonight, Michael Thundercrap and Kester. Yeah, that's me. How uh, are you doing, man? I'm, you know, I'm doing fantastic. Are you ready for another Rocky and Asia thing? You, uh, Journey Part 2? Journey Part 2. So, um, we did one of these episodes a while back. Yeah. If you happen to not, if, oh man, I really hope this is nobody's first episode of Double Feature, (laughs) always my fear. Uh, we're doing a strange, convoluted, totally wrong, but we're making it up as we go. Right. Uh, thing. We have a lot of movies that we want to cover and we needed to come up with a scheme Yeah. and we're calling it a journey. This is our scheme. So we're going to cover all the Rocky movies Uh and we're going to cover the evolution of Japanese samurai movies as it came to America and then returned, boomeranged, boomeranged back, back to the homeland. So you're still going to go really broad with that. You're not. You're not going to say like the evolution of Michael Kester's DVD library. Of no, I think. I Asian think once films. we get to the end, you'll totally understand this journey. I'm so, actually kind of proud of it. So there's basically about six notable Asian films in, in the entire the existence world. of man. Actually, seven because uh, there's another one that we're going to do. Ichi the Killer. Yeah. That, you know, that needs to happen soon, too. I'm tired of waiting on that shit. We were going to do it, and then it seems like, well, we got to do another Rocky episode. That definitely has to come up. And then so much Japanese all at once. People might need to read subtitles twice this month. That might just need to happen. Not a big deal. I am going to give our listeners the credit. I'm going to say they, unlike Rocky Balboa, can read. We're going to spoil both Rocky II and Sex and Fury. Perfect. Beautiful. And I think we're going to go in that order because that yeah. seems to be the established order. If you uh, don't want to know uh, how Rocky II ends, if you don't know how Rocky I ends, we might spoil ooh, Rocky Yeah, one. definitely going to spoil that. Um, and if you didn't see the previous episode with Rocky and Shogun Assassin, we'll probably talk a little Shogun. Probably won't spoil it. If you don't want to get spoiled, we got chapters up in the thingy with the drop and the click. And the, then you're all the way on to next week even. So we begin with Rocky II. And uh, the music is what we begin with. We begin with the music. And the large scrolling, we're aware this has become an American icon. Yeah, right. We're no longer dealing with uh, small independent Surprise classic. Yeah, right. We're picking up uh, really several minutes. Sure. Um, I was going to say several minutes after Rocky 1 ended. But but it's actually... several minutes before Rocky 1 ends. And um, I like this for two reasons. Okay. I like it for, well, for the first reason, if you look closely, you get to see the uh, Steadicam operator in the bottom of the wide shots. Okay. And we spent a lot of time talking, excuse me, I spent a lot of time boring you with Steadicam stuff. Oh, it doesn't bore me. There are uh, certain things that don't bore me. The other things are the ones People wearing harnesses to film movies. Big on harnesses. Love harnesses. All right, great. Um, so that was thing number one, but thing number two is this movie calls bullshit on itself. Yeah. The entire purpose of showing that little, I mean, not the entire purpose perhaps, but the only bit of important dialogue from, uh, the opening ain't going to be no rematch ain't going to be no rematch, which is, uh, essentially what happens in Rocky Mm -hmm. two is ain't going to be no, ain't going to be no rematch. Exactly. And like all directly after, uh, sequels has to start in the hospital, go to the hospital. That's just the spot you want to be, right? The point you know you made a good first film in your franchise is when your leads have to be hospitalized. Sure. That's when <laughs> right. you know that the trip that they took, the arc of the film, 
ended with them expended and sure. completely just... They were done. They had to yeah. go to the hospital, yeah, right? exactly. They, they are just alive enough to be in the second film. And have an argument in wheelchairs. That's, yeah, that's just about it. Don't you let your orderly wheel you out on me. Right, don't you run out on me as Rocky gets wheeled out. <laughs> uh, don't you run out on me. So uh, the the movie kind of takes place over about a year. Mm-hmm. What, what is it? Ten, 10 months, months, as the the guy says at the end of the movie uh, when they're calling that stuff out. The first movie was made in seventy six, and mm-hmm. we're all the way up to seventy nine. Yeah. Now, so you can do whatever kind of weird math to place this in seventy six or seventy seven, or say the old movie was in the future, or whatever you want to do there. More importantly, production wise, is that we are now in the territory of directed by Sylvester Stallone. Right, Sylvester Stallone. See, I'm new to Rocky. Mm-hmm. I'm the Rocky newbie here. Right. So I understand that Stallone both wrote the first Rocky and mm-hmm. was the first Rocky. True. And now you're telling me that he wrote Rocky II, is Rocky II too, and directed Rocky II as well. Also produced uh, Rocky wow. II. Wow. Um, That's a full plate. With another gentleman, but I just like to attribute him to as many things as possible here. Uh, did the cinematography sure. as well. One man, one vision. Yeah. I imagine that if you're going to operate a study cam, you have to look like Sylvester Stallone yeah. does. I just assume that that's how fucking heavy those things are. So we get a couple things coming back. One of which is uh, what you have deemed the soggy alley boys. Soggy alley boys. Right. So as our story's progressing, they're getting married kind of quick, just uh-huh. jumping into the sure. whole Well, it's it's part of the later, thing. it's part of the later plot, but it, it's just a, you know, it's another point that they I kind they kind of need to do it. At this point they've been together. They need to get married just because it was the 70s and I guess that's the accepted way American to show that a couple success story, man. Yeah. That's the thing. The sure. next step is married, married baby. You have a kid and you come back from retirement, match. I guess. Yeah. It's the American dream, really. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny actually to think about that as the American dream, uh the the life, liberty and pursuit of property uh <laughs> rocky basically has everything at sure. the end of the first movie yeah it seems like 37 he's, grand he's completely yeah 37 grand all you need he that doesn't even run our show for six months <laughs> uh he's 